I'm certainly not sorry for perpetuating apartheid because I had no hand in it. I think that it was an evil and wicked system. The Institute of Race Relations has done several polls asking people who do you think is the biggest racist in politics in the country. Most people say Julius Malema. Okay. To say Julius Malema is obviously a racist. Of course it's going to be beneficial for white people to say that there's nothing to apologize for. But you seem to forget the fact that for a good couple of hundreds of years, black people were not allowed to get into the formal economy of the apartheid country here. When you're talking about your polls and saying that Julius Malema is the biggest racist in this country, what shocks me is the ability to even say that a black person can be the Great. biggest racist <laughs> in the country when black joke, people man. cannot even... <laughs> So in this really intense video, these two black South African ladies actually almost slaughter this white South African for what he has to say about his position on the apartheid regime in South Africa and his positionality as a white South African in South Africa. Let's listen to the speech by both parties and I'll be back for some really interesting analysis on what apartheid really represented in South Africa. Gabriel, firstly, are you apologetic and what real action, if so, would you pair that with? I'm certainly not sorry for perpetuating apartheid because I had no hand in it. I think that it was an evil and wicked system and certainly to be regretted. I think that race relations are a difficult thing to talk about. People find it very easy on TV in South Africa to speak about all blacks or all whites as if those groups are monolithic. Of course, there are great varieties within those groups. There are some white racists. Just this weekend, I was looking at a, a white guy that I've done a YouTube show with, Roman Kabanak, tweeting things that are clearly racist, getting attention out of that. That's, that's very bad. Mm -hmm. um, the Institute of Race Relations has done several polls asking people, who do you think is the biggest racist in politics in the country? Most people say Julius Malema. Okay. To say Julius Malema is obviously a racist, is not to say that all black people are obviously a racist. There's a huge difference between races and, and huge differences within races. The economy is smaller than it was in 2010. Black unemployment has doubled since 2008. But in terms of the racial composition of the middle class and the upper class, according to StatsSA's latest numbers, black people are the majority of every income stream in South Africa. Ayanda, to say you look less than impressed would be the understatement of the year. Yeah, I, I, I really am trying my best to not be shocked at what I'm hearing. Of course, it's going to be beneficial for white people to say that there's nothing to apologize for. You brought up numbers of unemployment and the economy, but you seem to forget the fact that for a good couple of hundreds of years, black people were not allowed to get into the formal economy of the apartheid country here. When you're talking about your polls and saying that Julius Malema is the biggest racist in this country, what shocks me is the ability to even say that a black person can be the right. biggest mm -hmm. racist in the country <laughs> when black joke, people man. cannot even benefit <laughs> anything institutionally from this power dynamic that was created by who? by white people. The white male race did this. They created a bad day. They created the world economic system that we are all beholden to. And unfortunately, we are now suffering because of that. For you to sit there and have the audacity and the gall to say that a black man is the biggest racist in this country, you must say that according to your audience of the IRR, Julius Malema is the biggest racist in the country. What you're painting is a picture that is simply not true. Lexi, as a younger South African, your take? I am also quite offended. It just shows that white people have so much privilege. We're all the same, right? Please don't disturb <laughs> as she's speaking. Yes. Thank you. I'm sorry, but my voice is not land. You can't colonize it. It's Woo! So uh, for me, white people have so much privilege to be able to avoid talking about topics like this. Because you said racism is a difficult conversation for you to have. Black people do not have the privilege of avoiding the conversation because they live in those conditions. Their entire beings are tied to that and they somehow have to make it out of the townships. They have to make it big for their family. And then added on top of that is the guilt that so many successful black people feel because they don't believe they deserve that success while the rest of their family is at home still under this big boot of the white man.
So no, please don't tell me that white people do not owe us an apology, because they do. And they have never given us that apology. Do you want to withdraw your comment, Gabriel, having heard what both Lexi and Ayanda have said? Ayanda said that, I should, that the poll should refer to the IRR audience, but that wouldn't be true. The people who said that Julius Malema is the biggest racist in the country were randomly selected. And that polling question has been done more than once. So I'm not saying what I think. I'm just saying the upshot of a, a particular exercise. I also didn't say that I forgot the legacy of white oppression, of racism. The boots of the white man certainly came down on every black person that it could in South Africa since the Union. The thing is that black unemployment has doubled since 2007, 2008. So it's important to recognize that history didn't end in 1994 with apartheid. There's been a whole new story since then. And in that Thanks time, to who? the people in charge, according to me, are the president, the ruling party. <laughs> I've heard here that black people can't be in power. They can't benefit from the system because maybe democracy was invented by white people. I dispute that. I think democracy is a universal principle. I think our constitution was written by people of all colors and it binds us all as South Africans together. And okay. in our constitution, the president benefits, the cabinet benefits, parliament benefits. Those are the people who have the most power, the power of the army, the power of the right. police force. The ANC in the 2000s did a good job. Black unemployment reduced substantially by two and a half million. The piped water rollout, uh, houses, electricity, the improvement of education standards. The Rainbow Republic was not just a Mandela dream, it was a very lived... So it started well, but now it's also the fault of those very black people that things no, are as they are, people. is what you're Jeremy suggesting. Jeremy Cronin, there's white people in the ANC as well. It, there's colored people. It's not about race. Of course it's about race. This is what happens when you leave your oppressors totally unpunished. You perpetuate this amnesia, this arrogance, this denialism. Anyone who has any capacity to analyze data in this country will tell you that South Africa has become an even bigger white supremacist, anti-black racist neo-colony under a guise of constitutional democracy. And who do we blame for that? In the main, we blame the white ruling class mm. of South Africa, working with the international system of imperialism, in particular London and America, in then muzzling the ANC and pushing it against. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you what should have happened briefly in 1994. The land should have been returned unconditionally, unreservedly, it was never the land of white people. They imposed themselves, and from the moment they were here, atrocities came. Two, just like it was done to Germany, there should have been reparations. Let us go back to Jan van Riebeek. Yeah. I don't want to go too far back, and we're going to talk about reparations. Uh, Mark yeah, really interesting. What do you guys think? Um, you know, on this channel, we like to study and really go deep into these historical issues so we understand, um, put things into context, and have a clear understanding of why things appear the way they are in relation to blackness and whiteness and black and white studies, you know, across the world. And South Africa is one of those places where this multiracialism, non-racialism, and whiteness and blackness really comes to play in many Many different ways um, you know in society and I thought that this video was really interesting to really show that but in this video I really wanted to analyze what apartheid really represented in South Africa what really was it how did it come to be how did it impact society and really get a clear understanding of where this um, white South African and these two black South African sisters really stand in light of apartheid in South Africa. So on history.com, history.com has a really interesting article on apartheid and in the historical perspective of apartheid in South Africa and what it really meant for the South African society. So it says that apartheid or apartness in the language of Afrikaans was a system of legislation that upheld segregation against non-white citizens of South Africa. After the National Party gained power, in South Africa in 1948, its all-white government be immediately began enforcing existing policies of racial segregation, um, of racial segregation, 
in South Africa. Now, under apartheid, non-white South Africans, so this is kind of like blacks and coloreds, you know, what you would call coloreds are like, uh, a lot of people call the coloreds as probably not black in that regards, probably Indians and, um, you know, not black people anyway, but the blacks and the coloreds are a major um aspect of colored community in South Africa, okay? So it speaks about here that under apartheid, non-white South Africans, a majority of the population, were forced to live in separate areas from whites and used separate public facilities. Contact between these two groups was limited. Despite strong and consistent opposition to apartheid within and outside of South Africa, its laws remained in effect for the better part of 50 years. In 1991, the government of President F.W. de Klerk began to repeal most of the legislation that provided the basis for apartheid. Racial segregation and white supremacy had become center, central aspects of South African policy long before apartheid began. The, the controversial 1913 Land Act passed three years after South Africa gained its independence marked the beginning of territorial segregation by enforcing black Africans to live in reserves and making it illegal for them to work as sharecroppers, uh, you know, in South Africa. Opponents to the Land Act formed the South African National Native Congress, which would then become later the African National Congress. So the ANC, the present ANC we see, was born as a result of a revolt against the 1913 Land Act, which was um, a, an act that sort of like, it speaks here that um, the, the 1913 Land Act marked the beginning of territorial segregation. Most black Africans in South Africa, they were forced out of their native homelands uh, to live in certain reserves. And it made the, the Lands Act, Act made it illegal for them to work as sharecroppers in the lands they had historically known and understood how to work with. So it also speaks about how that the Great Depression and World War II brought increasing economic woes to South Africa and convinced the government to strengthen its policies of racial segregation. In 1948, anyway, the Africana National Party won the general election under the slogan apartheid, which literally means apartness. Their goal, that's the goal of the National Party now, was not only to separate South Africa's white minority from its non-white majority, but also to separate non-whites from each other and to, divide South Af and to divide black South Africans along tribal lines in order to decrease their political power. So eventually, apartheid became law. So it speaks about how that by 1950, the government had banned marriages between whites and people of other races. And we saw this a lot in, a, um, I think the, the movie is, is it Moby, Moby Dick? But it's a movie about, you know, racial segregation in the United States where um, blacks and whites couldn't even be in a courtship or relationship, so to speak. So this kind of like happened also under the apartheid laws in South Africa. So it says that by 1950, the government had banned marriages between whites and people of other races and prohibited sexual relations between black and white South Africans. The Population Registration Act of 1950 provided the basic framework for apartheid by classifying all South Africans by race, including Bantu, colored, and white. So the Bantu referred to black Africans, colored referred to mixed race, and then white. So these were kind of like the three racial divisions that now became what would be the new South Africa. Now, there was also a fourth category, which was Asian, which meant Indians and Pakistanis, was, which was later added. So, in some cases, the legislation split farmers, uh, it split families. A parent could be classified as white, while their children could be classified as colored. So, it was kind of like a mess, you see, because if probably before this act, um, you know, came to be, if there was a white or an Indian that had gotten married to a colored or a, a black had been married to a colored or a white, um, the law now proved that probably a parent and, a, and their children couldn't be of the same racial class. So, a parent could actually be white while the, the, the children could then now be colored or Asian. And that caused a, really, a lot of mess, you know, politically in terms of, um, you know, in terms of their documents. So it also speaks about how a series of land acts 
set aside more than 80% of the country's land for white minority and passed laws required non-whites to carry documents authorizing their presence in restricted areas. So these past laws were kind of the uh, one of the basis for the Soweto uprising where um, a lot of um, people got frustrated with the fact that they always had to go out with this document to prove that they were, you know, probably certified or to prove that they are legally um, um mandated to live in those regions and i've seen some really terrible clips of where some of the uh, white policemen at the time actually unleashed these really terrible dogs um to attack the blacks um in some really some really crazy videos on youtube anyway it was really unfortunate uh where south africa was in terms of its these racial laws at the time but anyway, the research here speaks about how that, you know, these past laws required non-whites. So the blacks, the colors, the Asians, and, uh, you know, they were required to carry documents authorizing their presence in restricted areas. So if there was a restricted area or an area designed for only the whites to live, an area secluded only for the white minority, your reason to be in that region would be illegal without a past law, uh, a past uh, a document. So you had to have a dumb pass uh, to prove that you had you were legally you know allowed to be in that region that was restricted for a certain group of people this was this was south africa so it speaks about how in order to limit contact between the races the government established separate public facilities for whites and non-whites, limited the activity of non-white labor unions and denied non-white participation in national government now uh, to go now to um, uh, this character called Henrik Vef Wood. Julius Malema speaks about Vef Wood a lot, who was, I think he was a member of the National Party in 1948, who was a proponent of this apartness or apartheid, and he was really pushing that, you know, whites and blacks or whites and non-blacks, and whites and non-whites should be really separated in Africa. So it speaks about that Henrik Vef Wood, who became Prime Minister in 1958, refined apartheid policy further into a system he, he referred to as separate development. The promotion of Bantu Self-Government Act of 1959 created 10 Bantu homelands known as Bantustans. Separating black South Africans from each other enabled the government to claim there was no black majority and reduced the possibility that black people would unify into one nationalist organization. Now, every black South African was designated a citizen of one of the Bantustans, a system that supposedly gave them full political rights, but effectively removed them from the nation's political body. So in other words, the government didn't want the, the black majority to be a part of the main governing body, which was the National Party. So it created these 10 regions, which were called Bantustans, and the blacks had to choose to become one of the Bantustans, which would then give them political prowess in those regions, but not within the central governing body in South Africa. So it says that in one of the most devastating aspects of apartheid, the government forcibly removed black South Africans from rural areas designated as white to the homelands and sold their land at low prices to white farmers. So this is where the likes of Julius Malema and um, his vice, uh, EFF vice president Floyd Shivambu usually describes as land thieves. So in other words, most of these lands in South Africa were sold to low at, at low prices uh, to white farmers. And so when Julius Malema, the likes of Julius Malema, the EFF speak about land expropriation without compensation, they're actually arguing that there's no need for compensation because most of the land that is being controlled by the, the by white farmers in South Africa at the moment were sold for land prices and they were grabbed from people who originally owned them, who were the black people. And now to transfer that land actually doesn't need compensation. So this is the argument of the EFF um, in this regard. So it says that in one of the most devastating aspects of apartheid, the government forcibly removed black South Africans from rural areas designated as whites to the homelands and sold their land at low prices to white farmers. So from 1961 to 1994, more than 3.5 million people were forcibly removed from their homes and deposited in the Bantustans where they were plunged into poverty and hope hopelessness so now i think probably the bantu stance is what probably would be part of what today is really referred to as um in south africa 
as the townships okay so these bantustans now were now they now represented these areas where man, majority of the blacks were now flocked while uh, the land which they previously owned were sold at cheap prices to white farmers so now opposition of opposition to apartheid now began so it speaks about how resistance to apartheid within south africa took many forms over the years from non-violent demonstrations protests and strikes to political action and eventually to armed resistance together with the south indian national congress the african national congress organized a mass meeting in 1952 during which attendees burned their passbooks so a lot of the dumb pass or that passbook the document would prove that they had legal access or to be in certain regions that were restricted where they, they burnt them in this really large congress in 1952 that what that involved the south indian national congress and the african national congress so it speaks about and and, I, and there's a there's a picture on on on, YouTube, on on the internet at the moment showing when Nelson Mandela himself burnt his own dumb pass. You see, so it speaks about how a group calling itself the Congress of the People adopted a freedom charter in 1955, asserting that South Africa belongs to all who live in it, black or white. The government broke up the meeting and arrested 150 people so this is the national party at the time in 1952 really broke into that part that meeting and really arrested 150 people and charged them with high treason now come to the sharpville massacre with julius malema and the eff members usually speak about the irresponsibility of the government at the time in 1960 um the sharpville massacre actually was in um occurred here he says that in 1960 at the black township of Sharpville, the police opened fire on a group of unarmed black people associated with the Pan-African Congress, an offshoot of the ANC. The group had arrived at the police station without their dumb pass, inviting arrest as an act of resistance. At least 67 people were killed and more than 180 people wounded. So the Sharpville massacre was a sort of like a resistance to the past laws, to the use of the dumb pass in areas that were destined or, you know, marked to be uh, restricted areas. That was what the dumb pass, uh, the, the Sharpville massacre um, sort of like represented in that regard. So it says that the Sharpville massacre convinced many anti-apartheid leaders that they could not achieve their objective with peaceful means. And both the Pan-African Congress and the African National Congress established military wings, neither of which ever posed a serious military threat to the states. Now, coming to the scene, Nelson Mandela. By 1961, most resistance leaders had been captured and sentenced to long prison terms or executed. Nelson Mandela, who was the founder of Inkumto with Seizwe, the party now that's actually being spearheaded and run and led by Jacob Zuma in South Africa at the moment, it says that Nelson Mandela was the founder of this party, the Inkumto with Seizwe, MK party. It was the military wing of the ANC. And we see that Jacob Zuma bringing back the MK party, the Inkumto with Seizwe, back to life seems to be replicating that military militariness of the ANC as a wing of the ANC. But it speaks about that at the time, the Mkonto with Sizwe was the military wing of the ANC and Nelson Mandela was incarcerated from 1963 to 1990 after he formed the Mkonto with Sizwe. He says that Nelson Mandela's imprisonment would draw international attention and help Ghana support for the anti-apartheid cause. Now, on June 10th, 1980, Mandela's followers smuggled a letter from Mandela in prison and made it public. The letter said, Unite! Mobilize, fight on between the anvil of united mass action and the hammer of armed struggle, we will crush apartheid. And so began this long fight against apartheid, which then saw, you know, um, South Africa free in 1994. But anyway, it speaks about how that um, by 1976, when thousands of black children in Soweto, a black township outside Johannesburg, demonstrated against the Afrikaans language requirement for black African students, the police once again opened fire with tear gas and bullets. So this was um, in 1996, uh, a Soweto massacre. And the protests and the government crackdowns that followed, combined with a national economic recession, drew more international attention to South Africa and shattered any remaining illusions that apartheid had brought peace or prosperity to the nation. 
the United Nations General Assembly had denounced apartheid in 1973, and in 1976, which is when the Soweto uprising occurred, in 1976, the UN Secretary Council voted to impose its mandatory embargo on the sale of arms to South Africa. And in 1985, the United Kingdom and the United States imposed an economic sanctions on South Africa. Now, under pressure from the international community, the National Party of Pieter Botha sought to institute some reforms, including the abolition of the past laws and the ban of interracial sex and marriage. The reforms fell short of any substantial change, however, and by 1899, Pieter Botha was pressured to step aside in favor of another conservative president who was F.W. de Klerk, who had supported apartheid throughout his political career. Now, it says that through a conservative Though a conservative, F.W. de Klerk underwent a conversion to a more pragmatic political philosophy, and his government subsequently repealed the Population Registration Act, as well as most other legislation that formed the basis for apartheid. De Klerk freed Nelson Mandela on February 11, 1990, and a new constitution which enfranchised black citizens and other racial groups took effect in 1994. And elections that year led to a coalition government with a non-white majority marking the official end of the apartheid system. So this is exactly why these discussions on apartheid usually seem heated because as you see in this video, um, apartheid was almost like a crime against humanity and then um, black people are usually really, really, they feel really, really dehumanized and really traumatic when they, when they approach a white South African um, who probably feels not sorry for apartheid and probably has this um, positionality or standard. I wasn't part of apartheid. I wasn't part of that regime. So I really have nothing to apologize about. And so that's why this heat and this whole uh, bitterness about apartheid still lingers in South Africa and really makes it really un an ungovernable place, um, you know, despite its multiculturalism and multiraciality. But anyway, it's been a lot of information in this video. Anyway, what do you guys think about it? Share your thoughts in the comments.